The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14499 in the name of Roderick Campbell on Universal Children's Day 2015. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if members who would like to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Roderick Campbell to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It gives me pleasure to bring this debate to the Chamber prior to the occasion that is Universal Children's Day. What is Universal Children's Day, you may well ask? Well, Universal Children's Day was established by the United Nations in 1954 to encourage understanding between children and promote children's welfare around the world. It's held on the 20th of November, the same day the UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959 and signed the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. The General Assembly recommended that all countries institute a Universal Children's Day to be observed as a day of worldwide fraternity and understanding between children. It's recommended that the day was to be observed also as a day of activity devoted to promoting the ideals and objectives of the Charter and the welfare of the children of the world. However, the Assembly suggested to governments that the day be observed on the day and in the way in which each country considers appropriate. Countries around the world celebrate the, the day in many different ways. In some countries, children receive presents. In others, they take part in events and activities or indeed are often allowed a holiday from school. At home in Scotland, Universal Children's Day has been chosen by the Scottish Parliamentary Cross-Party Group on Children and Young People as an appropriate time to launch their Children's right Man Rights Manifesto, to which I'll refer later. However, it will not have escaped your attention that, in fact, it's to be launched tomorrow, the 20th actually being a non-parliamentary day. Childhood, presiding officer, is the great stage in every person's life when the building blocks of their adult life come together. For so many children around the world, this right is not respected or guaranteed. But there is much to celebrate as we mark the 25th anniversary of the coming into force of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, from declining infant mortality to rising school enrolment. But this historic milestone must also serve as an urgent reminder that much remains to be done. Too many children still do not enjoy their full rights on a par with their peers. The UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, quote, the one thing all children have in common is their rights. Every child has the right to survive and thrive, to be educated, to be free from violence and abuse, to participate and to be heard. Sadly, this is so often not the case. Abuses of children's rights are an everyday occurrence in so many parts of the world. The latest data from UNICEF highlights the current state of children's rights around the world. For example, 16,000 children die every day, mostly from preventable or treatable causes. The births of nearly 230 million children under age five worldwide, about one in three, have never been officially recorded, depriving them of their right to a name and nationality. And out of an estimated 35 million people living with HIV, over two million are aged 10 to 19 years old, and 56% of them are girls. Globally, about one third of women aged 20 to 24 were child brides. Every 10 minutes somewhere in the world, an adolescent girl dies as a result of violence. And nearly half of all deaths in children under age five are attributable to undernutrition. This translates into the unnecessary loss of about three million young lives a year. Sad statistics. And although these are most likely to originate from developing countries, we must not be complacent about our own approach. Here in Scotland, the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 has, however, put the well-being of children and young people at the heart of policy and was designed to support the effective and consistent implementation of getting it right for every child across Scotland. This act was based on the principles and aims of the UNCRC and marks a positive step declaring Scotland's ambition to be the best place in the world to grow up. In addition, I welcome the changes brought about by the Reduction in Voting Age Bill that recognised the huge engagement of young people that was seen during the referendum. That response within, young, within the young population was a pleasure to behold and remains with so many of us. I also welcome the important role of the Commissioner for Children and Young People, further enabled through the 2014 Act, which places specific duties on all ministers to consider steps that can better give effect to the UNCRC and to promote public awareness and understanding of children's rights. These provisions take us much further than any previous Scottish Government has gone. And the current Education Scotland Bill seeks to reduce the attainment gap 
mostly by tackling the social divide experienced by so many children in Scotland. And in my view, the Scottish Government should be commended for tackling this fundamental problem that all too often frustrates the ambitions of less well-off pupils. Can I commend also the work of the many children's groups, such as Children First, Children in Scotland, Together and YouthLink, and, and the work of charities such as Bernardo Scotland, Within the Scottish Parliament, the cross-party group on children and young people exists to provide a forum for dialogue and exchange between the children's sector and Scottish parliamentarians and is made up of over 200 individuals and children's organisations as, well as well as over a dozen MSPs with a specific interest in children's policy. CPG members regularly work together to drive the children's policy agenda forward by bringing leading figures from the children's sector and decision makers together to debate and discuss issues of importance to children and young people. Further to this, of course, a subgroup of the cross-party group has been working together to produce a children's rights manifesto based on the cumulative work of over three years of participative work with children and young people across Scotland. Over 3,500 children have had a direct say in formulating the manifesto. It includes a series of asks based on the things that matter most to young people and encourages MSP and prospective parliamentarians to consider children's rights and calls on them to demonstrate their commitment to respecting and protecting those rights. It's a concise, values-based manifesto, which does not include specific policy asks, but rather outlines the way in which children and young people expect decision-makers to act in order for them to enjoy their rights as set out in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The manifesto requests that the parliamentarians promote and protect children's rights, actively listen to and help empower children to participate in the world around them, create respectful communities that celebrate difference, and support children to live full, healthy lives where they can aspire and achieve. The manifesto has been produced to help ensure that the rights of children are central to discussions in the run-up to next May's elections, and to accelerate the culture change needed to ensure full implementation of the UNCRC across all areas of policy. The manifesto has been reviewed by groups of children and young people to ensure that it is accessible and reflects their views. But issues, issues such as the age of criminal responsibility remain, as do issues of poverty, which without a doubt impact on health, as does homelessness. And let's not forget the need under Article 19 of the UNCRC for states to take appropriate steps to protect children from physical or mental violence whilst recognising that there remains a debate about the extent of parental rights to chastisement, which I'm sure this Parliament will return to. In conclusion, <coughs> Presiding Officer, by nurturing children and allowing them to achieve, they can grow into increasingly confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors to our society. But we must work hard to achieve and maintain this and not lose sight of those objectives. If we can continue to ensure that children can survive and thrive, learn and grow, have their voices heard and reach their full potential, we can be an example for others around the world to follow. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Roderick Campbell on securing a debate for his motion. And having had six children myself, I'm very aware of the rights to which they were entitled and which they rightly demand. And as the motion notes... The idea for a universal day was established by the United Nations in 1954, and the reason that it's celebrated on the 20th of November is because the Declaration of the Rights of the Child was adopted on that date in 1959, um, and it was, only, it was 30 years later that the Convention on the Rights of the Child was signed on the same date in 1989. Uh, and it goes without saying there's been significant progress for children since this day was first celebrated. Um, that doesn't mean the world can be complacent, though progress has not been enjoyed equally by all countries, and there's still much work to be done. Moreover, there must also be a recognition of the new and evolving challenges faced by children and their families in the 21st century. In 2000, all UN members, uh, all the U United Nations member states, agreed to eight Millennium Development Goals, many of which related explicitly to improving the rights of children, such as Goal 2 for universal primary education, Goal 3 on gender equality, which aimed to reduce gender disparity within education, and Goal 4, which targeted the reduction of child mortality rates. 
It was originally envisaged that these could be achieved by this year, 2015. However, uneven progress across developing countries for a variety of reasons has meant that child mortality reduced by half between 1990 and 2015, rather than by two-thirds, which was the goal. And the education target was missed as enrolment in primary school education rose from 83% in 2000 to 91% this year, but it's still short of universal enrolment, which was the goal there. And these goals have now been updated and enhanced in the new Sustainable Development Goals, which were agreed by the United Nations just two months ago in September. The more ambitious education goal has numerous targets, not only including gender equality in primary and secondary education, but wants to work towards ensuring quality early childhood development and care, and increasing the number of learners with relevant technical and vocational skills. The health goal aims to end preventable deaths of children under five and reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to fewer than 70 per 100,000 births. They also recognize the importance of economic growth and related employment for young people improving the education opportunities for young people in conflict areas and ending hunger and poor nutrition. I'm proud that the UK has agreed to the goals which will continue to ensure the rights of children and young people are at the front of the minds of policymakers and governments across the world. And I'm also very pleased that the UK became the first country in the G8 to meet the commitment to spend 0.7% of national income on international aid and that it was a Conservative-led government which enshrined this in law. The UK's international aid continues to contribute to meeting these new goals in a variety of ways. Over the last Parliament, it helped 10.9 million children, including 4.5 million girls, to attend primary and lower secondary school. It has trained 190,000 teachers, provided vaccinations for 55 million children, prevented 19.3 million children under five and pregnant women from going hungry and provided access to water, sanitation or hygiene to over 51.1 million people, which helps reduce illnesses and addresses the safety concerns of young people who are otherwise left in vulnerable situations without access to this. Moreover, the UK has a 35 million programme to tackle the despicable crime of female genital mutilation which has helped to reduce this by 30% in 17 countries. I am glad that our country recognised the importance of children's rights and has done so much through our international aid budget to improve these rights across the world. And I congratulate the member again for bringing this important topic to the Chamber today. Many thanks. And I now call Mark MacDonald to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, th thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I congratulate my, my colleague Rob Campbell on uh, bringing this important debate to the chamber today? And can I also uh, apologise at the outset that due to a pre-arranged meeting, I will have to leave at the end of my speech, so we'll not be able to stay until the conclusion of the debate. Um, uh, Rod Campbell has quite rightly highlighted the work of the cross-party group on children and young people, of which I am one of the three co-conveners. Um, and I would like to just... Uh, re-emphasise the opportunity for MSPs tomorrow to come along to Committee Room 1 between 1 and 2.30pm and sign up to be a child rights champion. Uh, as Rod Campbell has said, this is, uh, this is not about specific policies, but it's about values which will underpin the decisions we take and the way we work uh, as parliamentarians. Yeah, like most members, I get invited to speak to uh, groups of school children in my constituency uh, on a regular basis, and often in primary schools, uh, I'm asked to go in and talk about the work of the Scottish Parliament and the work that we do. And one of the things I'm always very keen to emphasise to young people is that even although they are not of voting age, they are still my constituents, and they're still our constituents. And we still have a duty as parliamentarians uh, to represent them and represent their interests. And uh, I'm always very keen to emphasise to them that if they feel there are things that should be happening or things that we should be taking account of as parliamentarians, they should be contacting us and getting in touch with us. And uh, I think that 
building on the, the, the work that is being done around uh, us looking at respecting and protecting children's rights is also the opportunity for children themselves to feel that their voices are being heard and that we are uh, open to receiving, uh, whether it's letters or emails uh, or even visits from them uh, in order to raise their concerns with us about the, the communities that they live in uh, and how they can best be improved for them because I think one of the things that many children uh, who have spoken to me at both at these visits and also uh, in, uh, in, in correspondence to me is that they often feel that adults take it upon themselves to speak on the behalf of children without taking the opportunity to actually enter into a dialogue with those children and find out what it is that they want uh, first and that I think takes place across a range of uh, areas uh, of society, um, most notably in terms of education. And I commend the fact that in some places we're now starting to see young people's views being taken much more into consideration in relation to education and it not simply being parents' views that are listened to, but also looking at what pupils and what young people want as well. I think it's also very appropriate that we're discussing this motion today uh, on the day when a number of Syrian families uh, arrive in Scotland. Uh, many children uh, across the world uh, are being displaced and affected as a consequence uh, of conflicts, not just necessarily those in the Middle East, but in other parts of the world as well. Uh, and their rights uh, are often being violated horrendously uh, in many other places. And I think the, the work that is being done by the Scottish Government in terms of sending out that message that we welcome refugees and that we want to see ourselves as, as a safe haven for those fleeing conflict, I think is important uh, in that respect. And finally, presiding officer, I would just say that I, I would note that while it is not uh, Universal Child Children's Rights Day today, uh, it is uh, nonetheless uh, World Prematurity Day today. And it is another opportunity for us, I think, to remember that there are many children uh, who now come into this world uh, with sometimes with uh, associated conditions, etc., who, thanks to uh, the wonders of medical science, now have an opportunity to live a much more fulfilled life or indeed to survive beyond birth who didn't in the past. Uh, their rights are equally important, the rights of disabled children, uh, many of whom are non-verbal and unable to verbalise their own views and their own opinions. Those rights are equally important to be protected and respected, and we should remember that alongside uh, those other groups who have been mentioned today. But I commend Rod Campbell for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Many thanks. And I now call James Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start off by congratulating Roderick Campbell in securing this debate on Universal uh, Child Children's Day uh, and in, in, in securing so many signatories uh, to the parliamentary motion. I think it is important that not, not only do we celebrate this day, but we also celebrate uh, the importance of children. Uh, I know myself, as the father of two teenage girls, how much uh, my own children, uh, you know, how much joy they bring me and how much they uh, keep my feet on the ground when I return home from Parliament. As politicians, we all get, uh, I can see the Minister smiling, she, or no doubt she can draw on her own uh, experiences. But as politicians, we get so uh, hit up at times about, you know, what we regard as the really kind of crucial issues of the day. And the great thing about, you know, having a, a family that grounds you and children that ground you is that, they make you realise that family is, is really important uh, and th there are things that are more important than the, the political issues that we discuss in here. Um, I also want to you know, touch on the role that the UN plays in terms of promoting the role of children, not just in this day, but throughout the world. Uh, we've seen too many instances on our TV screens in recent times of how the rights of children uh, have been undermined. I think it's important that you have a strong role for the UN in, in speaking out. And I think that link uh, for us goes straight to Scotland in terms of the work that the Commissioner for Children and Young People uh, carries out. Uh, and Roger Campbell himself uh, did touch on that. I think it's important that you also bring that link um, into Parliament. Because if you look at the issues that we discuss on the floor of this Parliament, there are so many of them that are impacted uh, the, the impact on children. The obvious one is when you look at the, the education portfolio from the early years straight through school uh, and into college. And that's all about 
producing policies and producing budget priorities that give our young people uh, the best opportunity to take the, the to, 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 to set a good platform for, them, for themselves throughout education, but also runs into uh, other uh, policy areas, including health, uh, where health and well-being is very important. And also, I know as a, a deputy convener of the cross-party group in sport, uh, how important uh, the, the role sport plays in, in our communities and in our schools, uh, bringing young people uh, out and participating in, in so many events. Um, and we, see, we also see ourselves in our, in our visits to uh, constituency schools and in schools coming into the parliament, uh, how much... Uh, young people get out of you know, coming to, to the Parliament and seeing this place and also in questioning uh, the MSPs and holding them count to account because sometimes they, they give you a completely different insight. Um, I also want to touch on the, the role played by the cross-party group on children and young people that again Roderick Cam Campbell spoke about and I'll be interested to see the ideas that the cross-party group uh, brings forward in terms of of their manifesto for the forthcoming election. Because I do believe that it's incumbent on uh, all political parties to place children and the rights of uh, young people at the, uh, at the central part uh, of their election manifestos. So in summing up, I want to congratulate Roderick Campbell on securing this debate. I think it's excellent that we're able to celebrate the importance of children, not only in our personal lives, but the importance that they should have in uh, the priorities of this parliament and the priorities of the Scottish Government. Many thanks. <clears throat> Can I now invite Aileen Campbell to respond to the debate minister. Seven minutes or so, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I also want to add my uh, thanks and congratulations to Roderick Campbell for bringing forward uh, this motion and for drawing our attention to the work of the Cross Party Group, an organisation seeking to improve the life chances of children and young people. And I'd also like to put on record my thanks to all those who have participated in this important debate. As Rod Campbell said, it's a timely debate because this week we will celebrate Universal Children's Day and can reflect on Scotland's progress in recognising the UN Convention on the rights of the child. The U Universal Children's Day was first established, as others have said, by the UN in 1954. Now, back then, that generation were dancing to the sound of Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock, though I'm sure nobody in the chamber can remember uh, that tune. Um, I'm sure there's some rice smiles happening across the, the chamber. But more seriously, in 1954, the minimum voting age was 21. From next year, our 16 and 17 year olds will now have their say in all Scottish elections. This, along with other measure, measures, will ensure that the voices of children and young people are heard in the decisions that this Parliament will take. Thankfully, we have moved on from the days when children were encouraged to be seen and not heard. And like Mark MacDonald, I take very seriously the point that he made that children and young people are also our constituents with values and views that demand our attention. And last week I held a youth surgery with my MSYP colleagues, Rhys Harding and Megan Russell. And that was a very important think, message, I think, to, to send to young people that their MSPs want to listen to them and to their points of views and to make a difference where we can. 1954 was also the year in which food rationing officially ended in the UK. Yet in 2014 and 15, against the backdrop of harsh welfare reforms, almost 118,000 people picked up a three-day supply of groceries from Trussell Trust Scottish food banks, including 36,000 children. So having families and children relying on food banks in our resource-rich na nation is an anathema to our th shared desire to create a Scotland that's based on fairness, equality and social justice. So that's why this government and this parliament will continue to spearhead activity to ensure the realisation and strengthening of children's rights. Because the UNCRC is the heart of our ambition to make Scotland the best place to grow up. Provisions in the Children and Young People Act demonstrate our commitment to children's rights. Part one of the act, which commenced in June this year, placed specific duties on ministers to consider steps which can secure better or further effect to the UNCRC and to promote public awareness and understanding of children's rights. These provisions take us further than any other previous government. And we've also developed a model for child rights and wellbeing impact assessments. 
All government portfolios must now consider the possible impact of proposed policies and legislation on the rights and the well-being of children and young people in Scotland, and also to hear the views of children in taking forward any new initiatives. We will also continue to work in partnership with the Children's Commissioner and third sector organisations in a whole Scotland approach to making children's rights real. Also through the Act, we will support the effective and consistent implementation of Getting It Right for Every Child approach across Scotland. GIRFEC is firmly rooted in the UNCRC, and this approach means ensuring that we up the pace of change and increase our efforts because GIRFEC is and has to be about every child every time and not some children some of the time. And that's why here in Scotland we are tackling poverty and inequality head on because often it's their children that feel those harsh effects the most. So, for example, we've invested nearly 300 million in welfare mitigation measures. We've also extended the provision of free school meals to all primary one to three pupils, a measure benefiting an additional 98,000 children across Scotland. We also recognise the right of all children and young people in Scotland to fulfil their full potential. Research shows us that progress is being made to raise attainment and reduce educational inequity in Scotland, but that's not fast enough. For example, in 2008, just over two in 10 students from the most deprived areas of Scotland obtained at least one higher or equivalent. Last year, that figure was almost four in 10. For students from the most affluent areas, that figure is eight out of 10. So in other words, when it comes to higher, school leavers from the most deprived 20% of areas in Scotland currently do half as well as school leavers from the most affluent areas, and that's un unacceptable. And that's why we launched the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the 100 million Attainment uh, Scotland Fund to make a difference. And I think at that point, I think what James Kelly said about focusing in on uh, ensuring that all children get access to enjoy sport and culture is an important part of that attainment uh, agenda. So in recognising all of that, we want to make sure that literacy, numeracy and health and well-being are at the top of our priority and our top of our agenda because we need to make sure that no matter what, an income, what income is, uh, a family has, that children are not uh, uh, forced into uh, not fulfilling their potential because that represents a failing uh, in their uh, future. Now, recognising children's rights and ensuring our children and young people know the inalienable rights that they have for being children is a powerful tool because we want our children to be responsible citizens through the Curriculum for Excellence. And that doesn't mean simply knowing the articles in the UNCRC by rote, but instead ensuring our children and young people have a deep and meaningful um understanding of the rights and their application in Scotland and around the world. And that's why I've been so impressed by the work of UNICEF through its Rights Respecting Schools and, of course, Education Scotland's work in promoting rights. Because rights-based learning means we have children now in Scotland who understand that they have a right to play, that they have a right to learn, to a name, to shelter, and all the things that make their life comfortable. They also recognise these rights aren't universally enjoyed by children across the world. Rights-based learning offers a really beautiful way to ensure our responsible citizens and leaders of the future have empathy and tolerance and a realisation that we need to protect childhood for our global family. Because, presiding officer, I don't think that message has ever been more important than now, that more important message that we need to promote of peace, tolerance and solidarity. And that's what we have an opportunity to do through our rights-based learning. Because it's clearly unacceptable that so many of the world's children are living in extreme poverty or are unable to attend school. Now, Rod Campbell spoke of some of the harrowing statistics which highlight the tragic realities facing some of our children around the world. Also too mentioned by Jamie McGregor of infant mortality rates of poverty uh, eroding uh, childhood for far too many. Also uh, the, the gender based inequity that Jamie McGregor mentioned is important to re uh, reflect upon too. And that's why the UN has agreed to the Sustainable Development Goals. And these outline a number of universal high level objectives for countries including eroding poverty, ensuring access to education and achieving gender equality. And those goals will form the basis of a global partnership for sustainable development. And I'm very proud that Scotland was one of the first countries to sign to this impressive UN initiative. So to conclude, presiding officer, it's clear we have travelled a long way since 1954, but we still have challenges to face up to, especially if we want to say with any confidence that Scotland is the best place to grow up. The Child's Rights Manifesto, as Rod Campbell has articulated in his speech, offers a useful tool for us to consider what more we need to do to make child's rights real in Scotland. 
and I'm committed to doing all I can to ensure that children in Scotland get the best possible start in life that they deserve. Children only get one shot at childhood and it's incumbent upon each and every one of us, regardless of the party that we represent, to make sure that we get it right for them and that means respecting the rights that they have as children. So once again, I congratulate Rod Campbell for his uh, motion and his speech this evening and also others for taking part in what is a very important uh, and uh, timely uh, debate this evening in Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Roger Campbell's debate at Universal Children's Day 2015 and I now close this meeting of Parliament.